Hi, in this module, I'm going to be talking about the notion of R consistency. This is going to lead us to a look at that algorithm called AC3, which is going to enable us to prune domains much more aggressively than before in the context of backtracking search. So let's begin. But first, I want to review backtracking search. So backtracking search is a recursive procedure where it takes a partial assignment, x, its weight, and the domains of each of the variables in the CSP. If all the variables have already been assigned in x, then we just see if it's better than the best assignment we've seen so far, and if so, update it, and then we return. This is the, the base case. Otherwise, we're going to choose an unassigned variable, xi. We're going to look at all the values in the domain of xi and order them according to some heuristic, LCV. And now we're going to step through each of the values v in that order. We're going to compute the weight update based on the xi being set to v. And if this is zero, then we can just stop recursing right there. Um, otherwise, we're going to use this updated uh, assignment to, um, as an input into the look at head algorithm, to reduce the domains. And now if any of the domains become empty, then again, we stop recursing. Um, otherwise, we recurse. So last time we talked about the heuristics for choosing unassigned variable, ordering the values. These are the MCV and LCV heuristics. And then we looked at forward checking, which was a one-step look ahead. Now we're going to upgrade that to AC3. So before we get into AC3, I need to talk about our consistency using a, let's use a simple example. So suppose we have just two variables, xi and xj. xi can be one, two, three, four, or five, and xj can be one or two. So, and xi and xj are related via, via a single factor, which says that their sum must equal four exactly. So what does it mean to enforce our consistency on, let's say, xi? This means I'm going to go through each of the values in the domain of xi and try to eliminate it if, eliminate it, if it can't be satisfied by any value in xj's domain. Okay, so let's try this. So look at one. Does there exist any possible setting of xj so that I can do one plus something to get four? One plus one is not four, one plus two is not four. So therefore, one is just impossible without even knowing the value of xj. So let me eliminate it. What about two? Well, I can set xj to two to get four, so that's okay. Um, notice that it's fine that one um, plus two isn't four. It just matters that there exists one of the values in xj that work. So let's leave two alone. So what about three? Well, three plus one is four, so that's okay too. What about four? I can't add four to one or two to get four, so that gets eliminated. And same with five. So in the end, Enforcing our consistency on xi results in a smaller domain, which only consists of two and three. So notice I can eliminate values without even knowing what the exact value of xj is. So more formally, our consistency is a property, which I'll explain. So a variable xi is our consistent with respect to another variable xj, if for each value in the domain of x, uh, xi, there exists some other value in uh, the domain of xj such that uh, essentially all the factors check out. So formally what that means is that if you look at all the factors whose scope contains xi and xj, and you evaluate that factor on xi, xj, then you get something that's not zero. Okay, so an enforcing our consistency is a procedure that takes two variables 
and just simply removes the values from domain i to make xi are consistent with respect to xj, exactly what we did on the example on the previous slide. So let's revisit the Australia example and apply um, AC3. Okay. So here is the empty assignment. And here are all the domains of each of the variables. So let's suppose we set WA to be red. Okay, so as before, we eliminate um, the other uh, values from WA's domain, of course. And then we enforce our consistency on the neighbors of WA, in this case, NT and SA. So out goes red on both of these. Um, and now we continue try to enforce our consistency on the neighbors of NT and SA. But in this case, I can't actually eliminate anything. Okay. So now we're going to recurse. Um, and suppose now in the next level of backtracking, we assign NT green. So now again, we're going to um, apply uh, enforce our consistency on the neighbors of NT. So that will eliminate green from these two. So notice that one step should look very, very familiar. This is ex exactly forward checking. But AC3 doesn't stop there. And then it says enforce our consistency on the neighbors of Q and SA. Okay, so let's uh, enforce our consistency on the neighbors of SA. That eliminates blue from its neighbors. And now let's enforce our consistency on the neighbors of Q. So that eliminates red from the neighbors. And now let's enforce our consistency on the neighbors of NSW. Well, that eliminates green. And at this point, now we're done. So notice what happened. Each of these domains is only left with one value. So even though we're still in the context of backtracking search at NT, and we're still trying to figure out what to do with NT, by looking ahead, we've actually seen what values are even possible. And we have essentially solved the problem. So now, formally, we haven't set these values yet. We just eliminated their domains. But backtracking search uh, recurse, recursing on the rest of these values should be really a walk in the park. You go into SA and you set, set it to blue, set uh, Q to red, um, NSW to green, and V to red, and you're done. So this shows you the power of AC3. With one fell swoop, it basically can clean out a lot of the domains and reveal kind of what the actual uh, uh, assignments values are possible here. So here is AC3 uh, more formally. So remember, forward checking is what you do is you, when you assign the variable xj to some value xj, literally xj, you set the domain uh, to only include that value, and then you enforce our consistency on the neighbors of neighbors xi with respect to xj. Okay, so here's a picture. So you're setting xj, and then you consider all the neighbors of xj, uh, for example, xi, and then you enforce our consistency on xi. So you try to propagate what you know about xj to xi and try to eliminate xi's domain. So now AC3 just repeatedly enforces our consistency, and there is nothing left to do. So here's the algorithm. Um, we're going to maintain a working set of variables that we need to go process. So we start with xj, which is the variable that we just assigned. And while there's still variables to process, we're gonna just remove any xj from s. There's order doesn't really matter here. And then for each of the neighbors xi of X, xj, we're going to enforce our consistency on that neighbor with respect to xj. So propagate the constraints out. And now if the domain 
of xi changed, then we're going to add xi to s because we know more about xi now and we can hopefully propagate the information farther to its neighbors. So notice that um, a variable could be revisited multiple times. So this is kind of like breadth for search with exception that um, you might visit a node uh, more than once because you might propagate some value to another neighbor and that uh, value might be uh, constrained something else and then you might get more additional information back um, and this can kind of go on for a while. But it does run in um, polynomial time. You can read the notes for a little bit more details about the running time. So as great as AC3 might seem, it's not a panacea. And it shouldn't be. And it shouldn't be surprising because solving a CSP should take an exponential time in general. And AC3 isn't doing any sort of backtracking search. So here is a small example that shows when AC3 doesn't do anything. So here we have a mini Australia here with three variables. And suppose each of them can either be red or blue. Red or blue, red or blue. So immediately you should realize that there is no consistent assignment to three variables with only two colors such that any pair can't have the same color. But what happens if you run AC3? Okay, so let's look at this uh, factor here. So WANT. So this is R consistent because if I assign WA red, then NT can be blue. If I assign WA blue, then NT can be red. So if I just look at this local configuration, there's no problem. And analogously, if I look over here, there's no problem. And if I look over here, there's no problem. So AC3 doesn't detect a problem, even though there's no satisfying assignment. So the intuition here is that AC3 and in general R consistency, all it's doing is lo looking locally at the graph and it says it only uh, detects problems that are kind of blatantly wrong, which can be detected locally. But you can't avoid exhaustive uh, search to actually detect the, the kind of the deep problems. So let me summarize here. Enforcing R consistency is a way to take what you know about one variable's domain to propagate that information via the factors to make uh, reduce the domains of its neighbors. Forward checking only applies R consistency to its neighbors, and this was already you know, somewhat effective. AC3 just takes that uh, to the extreme limit and enforces R consistency on the neighbors and their neighbors and their neighbors and so on until you converge. So it's trying to kind of exhaustively enforce our consistency as much as possible to eliminate as much of the values from the domains as possible. And of course, remember that uh, AC3 forward checking or look ahead algorithms, which are used in the context of backtracking search to detect inconsistency so we can prune early and also to maintain these domains so that we can use them for heuristics such as MCV and LCV. And look ahead turns out to be very, very important for backtracking search. If you can look ahead and detect an inconsistency, then that saves you the work of actually having to recurse and explore a combinatorial number of possibilities. Okay, that's the end.